this. So we're uh, doing a study on the book of Ruth. We've covered the first three chapters, and tonight we'll hit the final chapter, the finale, the kind of culmination to this whole experience. And if you've been following along, one of the things I've tried to challenge you with is to look at the book of Ruth and really the whole Bible, but for now, just the book of Ruth, looking at it three-dimensionally. And here's how it kind of sum that up, is why do we even have the book of Ruth? In the Bible, like what purpose does it serve? Is it just a you know, cool little love story? When you look at where Ruth fits in chronologically, you have you know you got this period of time Moses and Joshua and, and the people are led into the Promised Land. You got that period of time over here. You got where there's King Saul, King David, King Solomon, the monarchy. This is a period of time when there's no real leader. It's after Moses, Joshua, and before any of the kings. And it's a time when everybody just kind of did what was right in their own eyes. It's this time of the judges, which is an absolute period of immorality, corruption, uh, the depravity of mankind. It is honestly some of which is like NC-17 stuff. You've got gang rape, molestation, uh, you know, body dismemberment. You've got incest. It's a laundry list of just as shows you how depraved human beings can be. And in the middle of this 490 year period, you got the book of Ruth. And I'm sure within 490 years, there's a lot of events that happen. You know, I mean, look at America's history. You go back 490 years, there's not even America. We haven't even got to Twilight's last gleaming. We haven't even got to Twilight's first gleaming. George Washington is not even a gleam in his great, 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 great grandparents' eyes. This is before the pilgrims. So there's a lot of things that can happen in 490 years. And yet, the Holy Spirit puts in the book of Ruth. Why? It's like, well, you know, this period of time is really bad, and it's kind of disgusting, and it's uh, absolute immorality. So let's put a cute little love story in there. Is that all it is? So you could take that approach, but we're looking at this three-dimensionally. What I'm going to show you is we've been talking about this along the way. I think that the book of Ruth is the single most important book of the Old Testament for the church. And I'm sure I'll get some emails. Oh, the church is hidden in the Old Testament. True. Hidden. And one of the places it's hidden is the book of Ruth. And this is one of the most important books of prophecy for the church. And that's some of the things we're going to look into. So it is way more than just a love story. So let's start. With you. I'm going to show you a couple that should say Ruth chapter four. There we go. I want to show you a couple of images that's going to set the stage for how we look at this in 3D. So look at this picture. What do you got? What do you see first? Uh, you see a couple of animals. You see a lion. Okay. What's that got to do with the Bible? Oh, isn't that one of the, isn't that one of the phrases or the descriptions, one of the titles of Jesus Christ? The lion of the tribe of Judah. Isn't that one of them? Oh, and you see a lamb. Isn't that one of the also titles of him? Also, it's, it's the Lamb of God. Like the first time he comes down to the Jordan River, John the Baptist says, behold, Jesus. No, no, no. He says, behold, the Lamb of God. So that's two titles of Jesus himself, the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb of God. Uh, what else do you see there? Oh, we see a crown. What's, what's, what's a crown symbolic of? Royalty, right? King or queen or something like that. So you got a lion, you got a lamb, you got a crown. And Jesus also, that's one of his titles too, right? King, king of the Jews. Uh, but you also see some person there holding what looks like either a scepter or a sword. Maybe it's both. So how are all these connected? Uh, well, the lion, the lion of the tribe of what? Tribe of Judah. Hmm. Who was Judah? Oh, that was one of Jacob's 12 sons. Okay. If you remember back, if you've done your little uh, reading through on Genesis, you know that there's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then Jacob has these 12 sons. And on his deathbed, he kind of gives these sons a blessing, which turns out to be a little encrypted prophecy for each of the sons. What will happen with their descendants? Those sons will each have families and tribes that flow out of that family. 
And Judah, his blessing or prophecy was that the scepter will not depart from Judah. The scepter, the crown, the king will come from Judah's line. Wait a minute. Well, who came from Judah's line? The Messiah? Absolutely. Jesus was the lion of the king of Judah. So you kind of see the connection between the lion and the scepter. And of course, the lion and lamb and the crown. But there's also a question in this. Who is worthy? And another question you might ask is, who is asking that question? Who's asking who is worthy? And what's the answer to the question? So there's a lot of things that you could kind of interconnect. And all this is the overarching picture of the Bible, but also the book of Ruth. I titled Ruth chapter four from Ruth to Revelation. Because Revelation chapter five, there is an event. And we'll talk about this. Well, actually look at it. John does a time jump. He gets transported into some period of time that's beyond us, beyond our current day. And he gets a chance to see the world. And that event happens in Revelation chapter five. He sees actually an event in heaven. Revelation chapter five is really the book of Ruth four with the decimal moved over. It's foreshadowing what is going to come later. So that's a, that's a little, a little sneak peek of what's to come tonight. Let me show you one more picture though. So you see some trees and if you glance right past it, I like, I like to use these kind of 3d holographic images to kind of set the stage because this is a metaphor for this right here. Scripture. If you just read through these little stories, oh, Boaz falls in love with Ruth and they get married and they live happily ever after. And that's all that it is. All you're doing is seeing trees. But if you look closer and you peer into this image, you're going to see 16 different animals. And the more you look at it, the more details it'll come from. It. So we didn't want to just look at Ruth and just read through because you can read Ruth in one evening. Like it's four chapters. It's cool. It's an easy read. It's kind of events that take place and they do live happily ever after. So much more to it than that. So we're going to look at a deeper look at Ruth and a deeper look at scripture because you can apply this to all the other, the other 65 books of the Bible. So let's look at this. We're talking about a multi-layered approach. What is this, what is this layered approach? Well, multiple levels of application. One, it's historical. These are real people. We know in history, we have secular records that there was a man named Boaz and a woman named Ruth and Naomi. We know that. Historical and biblical. These are real people that happen in real time and a very interesting point in history known as the time of the judges. It's also very practical. Now, you're asking like, well, how in the world can something, so a, a culture a society and people that lived 3,200 years ago, that's 3,200 years ago, have anything to do with our modern age. And what you find out, there is a lot. So there is a practical application because the heart of human beings and God's relationship to them doesn't change from Adam and Eve to right now. But there's a third level, and that's the prophetic aspect of it. It's the mystical side of how this relates to future events then and now. And I'm talking about the future of Ruth and Boaz at that period of time, 1200 and something BC, their future, but also our future. Because one of the things you'll, that I hope that I uh, can condition you to think by just saying it every single week is that everything in scripture, there is a historical part to it. You know, we read about it. I mean, from Genesis to Revelation, there are historical letters and events that happen. It's also very practical. Isn't that, isn't that what we learned? That all scripture is good for correction and teaching and reproof. It's to show us how to do things, why to do things. You know, what do we do when we get it wrong? That's scripture. There's practical. But it's also prophetic. Every single thing in here, everything in the Bible points to either Jesus' first or second coming. It's not just about daily living. That is a part of it. It is to teach and correct us. It's also to point to Jesus' first or second coming. We sometimes get stuck on just the first coming. He's coming a second time. And scripture points to that. So this is kind of like what we've talked about, historical, practical, and prophetic. And the book of Ruth falls into this. But I want to take you to another level. And we're not going to be able to get into this tonight. But next week, after we wrap up the story, there is another aspect to Ruth 
that we're going to look at. And it's what the ancient rabbis called a remez. It's a hint of something deeper. And there is something more going on underneath Ruth than meets the eye. So we're going to look at chapter four tonight, but then we're going to go deeper into it next week. And uh, you don't want to miss that because there's going to be some shocking surprises of that. Okay, now I mentioned that this, the timeline of this happens after they went into the promised land under Moses and Joshua. And before you get to King Saul, King David, King Solomon and the monarchy, it's a time of the days of the judges, probably around the time of Gideon. It kind of lines up with that. And the what triggered all this was a famine. You can read about this in Judges 6, 2 through 5. There is a, there's a famine that's going to take place, and it forces uh, two Jews, Naomi and Limelech, to either sell their land or something, but they travel off into Moab, modern-day Jordan, to basically feed themselves and feed their family. So they go over there. You've got, uh, you've got Naomi and Limelech. They have two sons. Those two sons marry two local girls from Moab, which was against the laws we'll look at. Um, <clears throat> and in the process, Elimelech dies. The two sons die. And you have Naomi with these two daughter-in-laws. So she decides to go back home. The famine is now over with. And I titled this Till Death Do Us Part because at first both daughter-in-laws are going to go. But then she encourages them to go back home. Look, guys, it's actually against our scripture for any of the guys in Israel to marry you. So why are you coming back with me? You're young. Stay here. Stay with your family. Stay with your parents. You know, marry some good little Moabite guys and, and raise a family. And one of them does. But Ruth gives this sevenfold commitment. It's that, that literally it's like, hmm, where you go, I, I will go. Uh, where you live, I will live. Uh, your God that you worship, I will worship. Where you die, I will die. Where you're buried, I, will, I mean, it is till death do us part. It's an incredible commitment. So they get back to Israel. Um, they got to find a way to feed themselves. And so there is a process where, where Ruth can go out there and glean in the fields and make some money and, and gather up some grain. Um, but all this is overshadowed by one of, one of God's laws. And God had instituted... Hey, guys, setting up our society. Here's how we do our justice system. Here's how we do our welfare system. And oh, by the way, no Ammonite, no Moabite, or any of their descendants can enter into the assembly of the Lord. They can't worship with us. They're not saved. They're excluded, even to the 10th generation. So that means Ruth can go back there. She's not, she, she has no access to God. Um, she can't worship in the synagogue with them. The guys can't date her, and they definitely can't marry her according to God's law. And that's what overshadows this, because Ruth is a Gentile, and what the law couldn't do, grace will break through. She will be saved by grace. You see the thread? Uh, in chapter three, we had this, this event of, of the threshing floor scene, right, which a lot of people get wrong because... After the process of gleaning, uh, Naomi, the mother-in-law, is going to coach her as to how to um, this whole kinsman redeemer with Boaz. And when you read it, just on face value, you think, man, what is what is happening here? Because she coaches her. Hey, listen, he's going to be sleeping at the threshing floor. Ch catch up, you know, wait till he, he gets there. Uh, wait till he's had a little bit to drink. He's asleep there slip up in there and uh, here's what you say. So she coaches her and Ruth does it. And Ruth comes in, in the middle of the night and the guys, I'm not saying he's drunk, but describes him as being in good spirits. And she comes up in the middle of the night and hat tells him, put your skirt over me, which basically sounds like to us, hey, let me slip under the covers, cue the Marvin Gaye and let's get it on. That's kind of what it sounds like if you read it. Three-dimensionally, though, that is not what's happening. She's not asking uh, him to hook up with her. It's way worse than that. She is basically essentially saying, marry me, let's raise a family. You're my kinsman and redeemer. You can redeem the land, you can redeem me, and this is what this is all setting up. <clears throat> and we talked about the hymns. I mean, this, the skirt, put your skirt over me, is, is, is in the Jewish law, 
It's essentially where God says, hey, I have put my skirt over Israel. They are my children, and I'm going to take care of them. It is burning building, and Superman puts the cape over Lois Lane and says, I got you. I've taken care of you. So it wasn't a signal to let's get busy under the covers. By the way, the book of Ruth here, there's three of these ancient laws. And you might think this has nothing to do with me. I don't need to learn them. But these are three laws that God established. There was the law of gleaning in chapter two, the law of Leverite marriage in, level, in chapter three, and this thing, law of redemption, we're going to look at in chapter four. And you may think these have nothing to do with you. Remember the 3D approach, the multi-layered approach? There's the historical. These are three historical laws that God established. This is in scripture. This is God setting up his nation. And these are three laws that he has. Gleaning, love, right, marriage, and redemption. They're historical. They're also practical. We could learn a lot from these laws. I mean, there's a lot of things that we think we have at the best. And uh, in chapter two, we learned about the law of gleaning. This was God's welfare system. How does the poor, the widows, and the orphans, how do they provide for themselves? We've got our way of doing it. It's not so awesome. God set up a welfare system, and it was a way for the poor, the widows, and the, and the orphans to, uh, to, to provide for themselves. A lot of practical knowledge there. Then we learned to the, the, the law of Leverite marriage, which deals with families, death, marriage, land ownership, and how God established us. That's the Leverite marriage, and it's going to actually culminate tonight. Tonight, we're going to look at this, this uh, fourth chapter, but... This law of Leverite marriage, just to re recap this, it comes from the word levir, which means a husband's brother. And it's a situation where there's a widow, a woman has lost her husband and she has no kids. In their culture, look, it's agriculture. You have to own land and you, I mean, how are you going to, you know, you can't run to the grocery store to feed yourself. You can't get a job as a receptionist or a teacher or a nurse. Like, how, how is a woman going to provide for herself? So God instituted these laws. The family steps in. And uh, she could go to the next of kin and put a claim on him to take her as his wife and raise up children for the family. And this is called the Leverite marriage. So tonight we're going to look at the next level of that, which is the law of redemption. So let's, let's recap. Let's pick up where we were last week and then see what's going on. And then we'll flow right into uh, to this final chapter. So this is chapter three says when, so remember Ruth went to this threshing floor, Naomi coaches her. Here's what you do. Here's what you say. You slip in there in the middle of the night. He's been drinking. Hey, put your skirt over me. They have a conversation. So now Ruth comes back home and uh, Naomi asked, how did it go? My daughter. Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her. Oh, wait, it doesn't say that. She told her everything Boaz had done for you, Naomi. Notice that? It's what has Boaz done for you, not Ruth, but Naomi. And added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. So six measures of barley. Is that because Naomi's hungry? He sent her this food? Why wasn't it five measures? Why wasn't it seven measures? Remember, every little number and every little detail in Scripture is there because the Holy Spirit wants it to be. What you're going to discover is two things. Number one, verse 17 accomplishes a couple of things. It will, it provides a transition for Ruth as she starts to exit from the story. Ruth is going to take a, a back seat in this. And uh, from here on, it's going to be about Mo Boaz and Naomi, Boaz and the mother-in-law. And when you start looking at these people more than just characters, more than just historical figures, these people point to something. Boaz is the kinsman redeemer. We have a kinsman redeemer, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He's the one that redeems us. We have redemption, right? Jesus is our redeemer. He has to be a kinsman to us. We'll get into this at the end. What does that mean, a kinsman redeemer? He's not just God, the father. He is a, he is a relative of ours, meaning we're all related back to Adam. When they describe Jesus as the second Adam, what do they mean? It means he's a human being. Yes, he's 100% God. He's also 100% flesh and blood human. God came down as a human being, 
that was born, cried, got hungry, had to have his diapers changed. He became a human being. He could get a cold. He got hungry. He fell asleep. He stumped his toe. He had all the aches and pains and frailties of human being. Like he became a person and he's a descendant of Adam. He can redeem us because he's one of our kinsmen redeemer. We're kin. That's what Boaz is. Naomi is from Israel. She represents Israel. She's a Jew. Ruth, what is she? Ruth is a Gentile bride to be that the kinsman redeemer will redeem. You have Jesus, Israel, and the church all played out right here. And, and it's interesting when you look at this, you put this forward, the church slash Ruth is going to transition out of the story and it's going to return back to Jesus and Israel, which is what we believe happens in that 70th week of Daniel when the church is raptured up whenever it is and the, 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 the events turn back to uh, God and Israel. Okay, so then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled. Today. How does she know that? How does she know Boaz will not rest? She knows because she was given a code a few verses before. Ruth said he gave, he wanted me to give you six measures of barley. Now to you and I, that means nothing. Okay, six measures of barley. We don't even know what the six measures are. Doesn't matter. People that talk about how much is a measure are missing the point. The point is, why did he give her six measures? It's because this. Jews, Orthodox Jews, see scripture a little bit different than we do. Number one, their Old Testament is the Bible, not the New Testament, okay? And all throughout the Old and New, though, they see something. They're, they're very, um, they're very uh, attuned and emphasize the Sabbath day. Why? Why is the Sabbath so important to them? They won't work on the Sabbath. They won't answer emails on the Sabbath. They don't walk more than 200 steps on the Sabbath. They don't cook on the Sabbath. Everything is set. They, they, they prepare the day before so that they have a day of rest because that's what the law says. They honor the Sabbath. Why? Why is that so important? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's one, of the, one of the commandments from God, okay? It's also because the entire scripture is built upon this Sabbath day. God created the world in how many days? Six days. Did he rest on day three? Did he rest on day four? No, no, no. He rested on the seventh day. Was that because God was tired? He get, get really worn out from all that creating? No. He was establishing something. And all the way through from Genesis on, everything's built upon this Sabbath day of rest. Matter of fact, they have a Sabbath year. They have a Sabbath of um, Sabbath week, Sabbath day, Sabbath month, all this. It's built upon sevens. <clears throat> so when he gives her six measures of barley, he's basically saying, to her, to a Jewish mind, I will not rest until this is settled. Okay. <clears throat> so this is going on. So Naomi and Ruth is talking. Here's what's happening with Boaz, though. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the city gate and sat there. Now, this city gate, to get a perspective, <clears throat> it's not like he goes up and pulls up a, a, a folding chair beside a chain link fence. The gate, these cities were walled, big walls, thick walls. <clears throat> and people came in through the city gate and he's going to meet with the elders at the city gate. Now, what is this all about? It's essentially our city hall. This is where all the, the government was, was housed, was inside the walls. They would put up buildings and offices inside the city wall. And this is how people come through. These cities were protected by walls and the people came and went through the gate. The officials would check the credentials and IDs of each person coming into the city. It's an amazing concept of putting up a wall and having people come through a checkpoint. That's incredible. What an immigration system. We're so much beyond that. We're so much more advanced. And yet our immigration director could learn a lot from little old Bethlehem, couldn't he? <clears throat> if there was a question about someone, they would meet with the elders at the city gates. So the elders are the officials of the town. And um, Boaz obviously was a wealthy landowner, but he also sat at the city gate. That makes him one of the key elders. One thing you'll see from this is, He's not just one of the main guys in Bethlehem. He might possibly have been the mayor of the city because he will 
direct what the other officials do. He will tell them to sit down. He will talk to them about what's going to happen. So may have been an uh, important guy. So he's sitting at the city gates. Says, when the kinsman and redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. So the kinsman redeemer listens to Boaz, sits down. We'll get into this uh, kind of uh, city, city guy, but this, this kinsman redeemer, this guy is obviously a very close relative and a closer relative to Naomi than Boaz. So Boaz is related to Naomi, but this guy is even closer. And uh, we'll look at it as possible this man was, was actually a brother of her dead husband. But what's this guy's name? What, what is this guy's name? This is an important dude. The whole story hinges upon this guy right here. Like it all, like there's important people, right? And they've all been named. We have Naomi. We have her husband. We know his name. We know their two sons' name. Everybody that's already died, is already, that we know their names. This guy, the whole story hinges upon here because if he goes on to marry Ruth, it's a whole different story. So he's an important guy. What's his name? He is intentionally unnamed. And um, actually, the, the word here for my friend, it's, it's, it could be translated, my friend, but also the anonymous one. So it, it, it appears that the Holy Spirit is intentionally leaving this guy unnamed, which is fascinating because there's two people that play a pivotal role in this whole book, and both of them are unnamed. Row up uh, Ruth and Boaz, star players in the story, right? How did they meet? They met by an unnamed servant, an unnamed helper to Boaz. Is that interesting? We don't know his name either. I'm, I'm bringing this up because what you're going to see is all throughout the scripture, this is a pattern that plays out. When Abraham goes to, to Isaac, he's going to sacrifice him upon the mountain. You know that story. There's Abraham, Isaac, the father, the son, and an unnamed helper. Okay? And you see this all throughout the scripture when they're trying to kill the royal line. There's always an unnamed servant that slips a baby away. So this unnamed helper, by the way, what's, what's another name for the Holy Spirit, the helper? It's interesting, right? What Jesus say about the, the Holy Spirit? He will never testify to himself. And here you have this unnamed servant. So I just, I want to bring that up here. It's almost like the Holy Spirit is intentionally leaving this guy anonymous. Boaz took 10 of the elders in the town and said, sit here. And they did so. So here's, here's 10 officials. And he tells them where to sit. And they listen to him. So the, he was at least as important, if not over these guys. So possibly could have been the mayor. By the way, little little trivia for it. 10 of the elders. In Hebrew, it's called the minyan, when you have 10 elders. You had to have that before they could have their synagogue service, before it could even start. Ten made it legal, by the way. <clears throat> uh, then he said to the kinsman and redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. Now, we're not sure when he says brother, is um, was it Boaz's brother? Or was maybe he's a cousin and this kinsman and redeemer is actually the brother to Elimelech? Or are they both brothers and he's just closer in line? But whoever, this guy right here is a closer relative somehow to, uh, to Naomi. And um, the land has to be redeemed. So this all goes back to this concept that the land stays within the family. And uh, here Boaz is calling attention of this man to the fact that Naomi, <clears throat> she is in need of a kinsman redeemer to step up and redeem the land and, and for her and that uh, she's now back in town. So kinsman redeemer. Four conditions to be a kinsman redeemer. It's called in Hebrew, the goel, your kinsman redeemer. And keep in mind, as we talk about this, Jesus is our goel. He's our redeemer. He's our kinsman and he's a redeemer. Had to be the nearest of kin. That's one condition. Had to be able to perform. You have to, to redeem a land, you have to purchase it back for the family, right? If you don't have money, you can't buy the land back. So you have to be financially able. You also had to be relationally able. If you're already married, <clears throat> uh, you already got a wife, then you're, you're, you're not able to, okay? He also had to be willing to. 
it's it's you're not obligated to it, but uh, you have to be willing to perform it. And you had to take on all obligations. If you're going to buy back the land from a widow, you also had to marry her. Okay, you have, you have to take on all obligations. So this is what it takes to be the go well. So Boaz talked to him, he says, I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here, the presence of the elders of my people that are all sitting there and he's talking to them. If you will redeem and do so, but if you will not tell me so I will know for no one has the right to do it except you and I'm the next in line. So we're both in the line. We're both relatives of Naomi. We can buy back her husband's land, but we also have to fulfill the obligations of of Mary. And so here's the, here's the shocking line. I will redeem it. He said, so here's what's going to happen. And I, I tell you, if this is, if this is a uh, movie playing out, it's this great romantic comedy. And let's put like a, a leading actor here, you know, the George Clooney, Brad Pitt, you got the young actress, they've been, you know, talking back and forth and, and, you know, the audience really wants them to get together. There's all this chemistry. And yet it turns to find out or come to find out, that the person eligible to marry her is not George Clooney, not Brad Pitt, but Jack Black. And you're like, wait a minute. So this guy steps up, says, I will do it. Man, so that, that's, uh, that's disappointing, right? Well, let's read on. Then Boaz said, okay, on the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabitess, because they're, they're together in this, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. Remember, he had to do it, they had to take on all obligations. The Leverite marriage is the next of kin, marries the widow. You with me so far? Marries the widow and takes her husband's land for himself. So by the way, he, he throws in, this is a little bit of a subtle jab. He's been calling her Ruth, but now he says, Ruth the Moabitess because he, it's a little bit of a jab here in a subtle way that he's reminding that this, that this guy, that she's a Moabite. And this guy knows this goes against God's scripture. So I don't know a, a, an analogy we could use in our day and time, but he's giving a description that this guy would be like, oh, a Moabite. Ugh. Okay, not sure. All right, let's look at this law of redemption. So this is what's going to happen with Boaz and Ruth. But this is something that God had established way back in Leviticus uh, for the nation of Israel. So uh, it's basically, it's going to have to do something with the Jubilee year. And without getting too mathematical, it's all based on sevens. The seventh day was the Sabbath day, a day of rest for people. The seventh year was a Sabbath year for the land. So a year of rest for the land, but then seven times seven years, 49 years, there was a day of rest for the nation. And on the Jubilee year, three things happen. All your debts are forgiven. All slaves go free and all land returns to its original owner. And uh, we'll look at some of that. Let's just, uh, let's kind of go through this. We'll read a little bit out of Leviticus so you can see how God has set this up. But you might be asking, why do I need to know this? Two things. Number one, because it'll help you understand what's happening with Ruth. But also, it has to do with Revelation chapter 5, which we're going to look at. So this will help you understand our future, or at least the future of the um, of the people that are here after the rapture, but that's a whole different discussion. All right, let's read this right here. So by the way, we talk about the Bible being the word of God. There is nothing more word of God than the book of Leviticus because it's God speaking, verbally speaking, almost the whole book. So here's what he's talking. He's talking to Moses. He says, the land must never be sold on a permanent basis for the land be belongs to you. Wait, that's not what it says. The land belongs to them. No, for the land belongs to me. God's saying that land belongs to me. And he's talking about the, 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 this real estate in Israel. Hard concept for us to get. That the God of the universe that owns everything has a piece of real estate that is his, and it's his land. It says, you are only foreigners and tenant farmers working for me. With every purchase of land, you must grant the seller the right to buy it back. Real quick, I don't want to get off too far down a rabbit hole, but this, this might be worth our time here. So I'll, I'll try to be quick with this. Uh, plus, I always like to use this as an excuse to bring this up. The con look out there and you see the ground. What we see is dirt, grass, weeds, you know, um, and that's all we see it as. I'm not so sure that that's how God views it. 
when you do a little study, you can take your app and you can go through the scripture and just, just, you know, kind of do a search on land and how the Bible refers to land, how God refers to land. I think it may be a little bit different. Let me give an example. And this is just a few. You can do your own study on, on this, but let, let me highlight three or four of these. When um, Jesus rides in through the golden gate on the donkey on the triumphal entry and they're singing Hosanna, Hosanna, and they've got the palm branches. The Pharisees are upset because they're say, singing that he's the Messiah and they get upset. What do they say? They say, hey, teacher, uh, you need to tell your people to cut it out because they're proclaiming you to be the Messiah. And what does he do? He responds back to him. He says, you know what? If they were silent, even the rocks and trees would cry out. Wow. You don't mean verbally, do you? Is that just a metaphor? And part of you wants to be like, hey, guys, quiet for a second. And just to see what would happen. So maybe he's just using that as an analogy that the rocks and trees would cry out. I don't know. Go back to Genesis, Genesis chapter four. Cain kills Abel. One of the first thing that God says to Cain is, Cain, the ground cries out with the blood of your brother. He doesn't mean audibly, does he? When Joshua has the conquest of Israel, he takes the people into the promised land and they got to wipe out all these demonic pagan tribes and they battle them for six years. And God says, hey, on the seventh year, I want, want you to let the land rest because it's weary from war. The land is tired. And my point is this, when you go through there, we see things a little bit differently. Skip ahead to Romans chapter eight. What does it say? For all people are groaning. No, wait, that's not what it says. For all creation is groaning. What's the creation? Us, the rocks, the trees, the stars, the sun, the moon, the oceans, the mountains. That's creation. And it says all creation is groaning with the pains of childbirth. When Jesus comes back, is it just to redeem uh, people? Mm -mm. He will come back to redeem the world and he will make a new heaven and a new earth. All I'm saying is I think sometimes we just see it as dirt and grass and God, that is part of God's creation. And one last little, one last little thing, this is probably taking it way too far, but I think about those rocks and trees that would cry out because they would recognize who their savior is. And I'm not trying to read too much into that. I'm just, I'm, I'm looking at how the Bible refers to all creation and how all creation is groaning somehow, some way. And does, 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 does creation recognize its creator? So the other day I'm walking around in the house and I'm just audibly talking to the Lord, which is what I do. I just, Father, I need help with this. What should I do about this? I'm just, I'm just talking to it. And I look over. And my dog's ears are just perking up and is just watching me. And now she's probably just waiting for that command, let's eat, because she knows those two words. But part of me thought about this, the rocks and trees would cry out in my name. And the, and, and the ground cries out with the blood of your brother. That this concept of this all creation recognize who its creator is. And here's this dog. I'm not saying a dog has a spirit or a soul or anything, because I don't believe it does. But I just wonder if that dog recognizes in some way that we can't understand who its creator is. And the same with the rocks and the trees and the land. And I know that's way off the deep end, but I just bring that to your mind that when God says, I, I, this land belongs to me, this is his land, his piece of real estate, and it's special to him. And that's all the way through scripture. All right, let's get back to that. Uh, it says, if one of your fellow Israelites falls into poverty and is forced to sell some family land, then a close relative should buy it back from him. God divided up the land and gave it to the 12 tribes of Israel. It's their, it's his land. And they are, as he explains it, tenant farmers that work for him, but it's to stay with them uh, for good. If there is no close relative to buy the land, but the person who sold it gets enough money to buy it back, he then has the right to redeem it from the one who bought it. We're going to see this play out in, uh, in Ruth. The price of land will be discounted according to the number of years until the next year of Jubilee. What that means is, Every, every 49th year, or in some cases the 50th year, it's, there's debate on it, but the year of Jubilee, all your debts are forgiven. That's how that was established. So you were not going to have eternal debt. So all your debts are wiped out. Your mortgage on your house, zeroed out. 
your credit card bills, zeroed out, no debt, everybody, it's a, it's a great reset. Uh, in this way, the original owner can then return to the land. But if the original owner cannot afford to buy the land back, it will remain with the new owner until the next year of Jubilee, which would be another 49 years. In the Jubilee year, the land must be returned to the original owner so they can return to their family land. Uh, suppose a foreigner or temporary resident becomes rich while living among you. If any of your fellow Israelites fall into poverty and are forced to sell themselves to such a foreigner, so an outsider gets hold of the land, they still retain the right to be bought back even after they have been purchased. So here's, here's what I want to show you. This, we're not, we don't have time to go through all this, but let me give you one example. God tells Jeremiah, I'm going to send Babylon here and they're going to wipe out this nation and take you guys into captivity for 70 years. Jeremiah is an old man. He ain't going to go into captivity and come back. Um, he tells him, I want you to go buy up your family's land. Wait a minute, God, I mean, we're about to be taken into captivity. Why do you need to buy the land? He says, at the time, the Lord sent him a message. He said, your, your cousin Hanamel, son of Shalom, will come and say to you, buy my field at Anatoth. By law, you have the right to buy it before, any, uh, before it's offered to anyone else. Jeremiah is the next in line. He's the next closest relative. Does that make sense? Then just as the Lord has said, my cousin Hanamel came and visited me in the prison. Jeremiah is down in a dungeon. And this guy's going to come in and almost say verbatim what God said he would. Please buy my field in Anatop in the land of Benjamin. By law, you have the right to buy it before it is offered to anyone else. So buy it for yourself. Then I knew the message I had heard was from the Lord. So I bought the field of Anatoth, paying Hanamel 17 pieces of silver for it. And I signed and sealed the deed of purchase before witnesses weighed out the silver and paid him. Now, he's going to go before the officials, just like Boaz is before the officials. And he's going to have a scroll. And I'm going to just skip over all this so we can get on with it. But the scroll, it has kind of a smooth side that you would write the details of it. And on the rough side, on the back side of it, there would have steps that the, a descendant of the original owner, cousin, brother, son, grandson, whoever, could come back and, and repurchase back the land. It was to stay in the family, right? So you think of a title deed. But on the back side, it has the steps to redeem the land in case you sold it to an outside. So that's that. What I want to do is use this as a stepping stone to take stone to um, do a time jump into the future. Revelation chapter five, because you're going to see a scroll written on the front and back, just like that title deed for the land was. And John gets transported somewhere in the future, but he gets transported into the throne room of heaven. And uh, that's, you can see this picture, you're going to see four living beasts. This is not an actual photo, by the way, of heaven. And 24 elders and someone sitting upon the throne. Let's just read what he says and see what you think. Then I saw a scroll huh, in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. So someone's sitting on the throne and he holds a scroll. There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll and it was sealed with seven seals. Interesting. That's the way these title deeds to the land were set up. OK, uh, by the way, the, the seven seals, think of it like a book that has chapter breaks. You'd have a scroll. You would come to a seal. It's like a chapter break. Break that seal. Read the next little chapter. Here's another seal. And that's how it was set up. This has seven seals. And here's this picture we showed at the beginning. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice. Who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and open it? So here you go. You got the, the question on that graphic I showed was who is worthy. It's a strong angel that's asking that. John says, but no man in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. You see, there's only somebody that can open it. An angel can't open it. It's going to have to be, it's a title deed, I believe, to the earth. And it has to be a kinsman of or a relative of Adam. So it has to be a human. It has to be a man and a certain type of man. John realizes no one can, can do it. Then I began to weep bitterly because no man was found worthy, blameless, sinless, stainless to open the scroll and read it. No man. That's the key to this. It couldn't be an angel. It couldn't be some type of heavenly being. It had to be a man, and it had to be a descendant of Adam. There's only one descendant of Adam that never sinned. I'll give you one guess who this. But one of the 24 elders said to me, stop weeping. Look. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory, and he is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. We looked at that graphic, right? The lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah, that's gonna, that plays an important role here. But then he says, then I saw a lamb. Wait a minute. I thought it was a lion. A lion, lion of the tribe of Judah. 
But here he sees the lamb, but notice what he says. And notice the lamb is capitalized. I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered. It is interesting when you go back and you look at all the accounts of Jesus after he was resurrected. You know, he stayed for 40 days, right? We have the uh, death, burial, and resurrection, and then there's 40 days before he ascends up into heaven. It's interesting that people don't recognize him initially right off the bat. You remember Mary? She thought he was the gardener. And he's talking, he's like, Mary, look, it's me. And he speaks to her and, oh, it's you, teacher. And then he goes on this road to Emmaus with two of the disciples. These disciples, they've been with him. They've been a part of his ministry. They walk with him for seven, seven miles. That's a, that's a long walk. Seven miles. He gives them a Bible study. They don't know who he is. They think he's a stranger. Why don't they recognize him? They take him in. They invite him in to dinner. And he's sitting around the table talking to everybody. And they still don't recognize him. And finally, they recognize him when he goes to break the bread. And I wonder why it was then that they, they recognized him. But something I wonder about Jesus, just a thought. Will we see the scars of his suffering that he did for us? John says his lamb looked as if he had been slaughtered. I don't know. That's something I'll let you go study on and come up with your own conclusions. But he was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God that is sent out to every part of the earth. He stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one uh, had a harp and they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song. These 24 elders, I want to challenge you to do your own study and find out who these are. Uh, this is too important to not understand who they are. And you probably need to study and come up with your own conclusion about it. But the 24 elders are important. And what they're going to do, they're actually going to sing a song of salvation, that they were redeemed by the Lamb. Okay, so <clears throat> I, wanted to, I took you there because it seems like the title deed that we see in Ruth is being played out as from the kinsman redeemer. It was the kinsman redeemer that redeems the earth. It is like what Boaz will do with the decimal point moved over one. So let's get back to Ruth. Says, then Boaz says, oh, by the way, he's talking to this kinsman redeemer. On the day you buy the land from Naomi and, and Ruth the Moabitess, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead man, dead with his property. At this, the kinsman redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because it might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Oh, well, here is where Boaz gets to step back in and, and uh, save the day. So this, he's, this guy is the nearest kinsman. He's the nearest kin to Naomi and Ruth. So I, I don't know what that means, but uh, let's look at this. Here's some things to consider. He would have to invest his own money to redeem the land. Uh, second, he would also have to marry Ruth. And, and, and if there was a son produced through them, that son would legally be the son of her dead husband, legally. that He would have the, the legal ownership of the land and want to inherit the property. Does that make sense? Third, the kinsman would end up losing both the property and the investment because he is filling in the gap from her dead husband. On top of that, not only would, would that son inherit the land that was redeemed, but also part of his, the kinsman's property, because he would now be his son also and would share some of the inheritance. So the kinsman would be depriving his own heirs. You see, so there is something to it. You got to have the money. You have to buy the property. And uh, there's a little bit of a uh, risk involved in this. So just a three-dimensional view of this. Uh, if Boaz is the kinsman redeemer, he's the one that's going to redeem the Gentile bride. And Ruth is the Gentile bride. Who is this near kinsman? What does he represent? This is going to be on the final exam. But I'm going to help you out. He represents, just a thought here, the Mosaic law, the law of Moses, the Torah, the Old Testament law. Why? For starters, he's nameless. And he, if he represents the law, couldn't redeem us. It was impossible for the law to redeem us, just like Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 8. The law of Moses couldn't save us, so God put another plan into effect. He sent his only son in a human body just like ours, except that ours is sinful. So that's something just to consider there. Verse seven, now in earlier times in Israel, uh, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This is like a 
basically a marriage license. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. And uh, we're going to kind of skip over the whole sandal thing. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And he removed his sandal. So he's giving Boaz the green light to go marry Ruth. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Killian, and Malon. It's the romance of redemption is what this is. Here's a three-dimensional view. Boaz confronts a near kinsman. The guy is willing to redeem the property. He's not willing to marry Ruth. I got to say, he probably hadn't seen Ruth. If he'd had, he, he might have changed his mind. Uh, he does the shoe thing to pass the opportunity on to Boaz. Boaz runs with it. He purchased the land for Naomi and also takes Ruth as a bride. Remember, both of these are, um, you know, uh, has to be redeemed. Both, Naomi and Ruth. As verse 10, I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, uh, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Today you are my witnesses. Then the elders and all those at the gates said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah. And that is, you know, Jacob's two wives who together built up the house of Israel. May, may, you, may, you, may you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a city. Ephrathah is kind of like the county. So you got Little Rock, Pulaski County. Bethlehem is a city and Ephrathah is the area there. And by the way, this famous in Bethlehem, this chapter is the reason we have Bethlehem on our Christmas cards. This chapter, what happens with Boaz and Ruth. This is the trigger that will lead to this all happening. Uh, this chapter is the reason that became the city of David. This chapter is the reason Jesus Christ is born in Bethlehem. It's all because of Ruth chapter four. And uh, this famous in Bethlehem also is linked to Micah 5, 2, which says to you, Bethlehem, the Messiah is going to come through you. That was the prophecy. And by the way, Bethlehem, Bethlehem is the house of bread and life. So it's interesting, the name and that Jesus would be born there. By the way, down the road on a particular night, speaking of Jesus and his birth, shepherds will be in the field by night. And the heavens are going to open up and a billion angels are going to um, sing and proclaim. Is that possibly Boaz's field? There's a lot of evidence that says that it might be that field. We don't know exactly for sure, but it, it would make sense. Boaz's field right there in Bethlehem, he's a wealthy landowner. He owns that land. That's going to stay within in his family. And you're going to have Boaz and Ruth, and they're going to have kids. And that kid's going to go through David and his line all the way down. Great, 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 great grandkids, Joseph and Mary. And they're going to have, give birth to, uh, to Jesus. Interesting. Okay, we're going to stop right there. But um, we're about halfway through this chapter. And really, let me just share this with you. We're going to see a weird verse in verse 12. And from there on, we're going to get into like a genealogy, right? The, the whole family tree. And most people just kind of skip over the family tree. Like it's a family tree. Why do we need to know it? There is so many things to this uh, that you don't realize within this genealogy. Let's go back to this three-dimensional view. If you believe that this book is written outside of time and space, that it's engineered by the Holy Spirit, it's not written by some dude who created this whole story, but by the Holy Spirit, then there is more here than meets the eye. And we're going to cover that. Okay, so next week, if you haven't already read the rest of Ruth, I want you to finish that up. But I want you to read Genesis 38. There, the last section of Genesis from 37 on is this great story of Joseph. And, and it's one of the best in the Bible, in my opinion. But in the middle of this, you get this, you go down this uh, rabbit trail of Genesis 38, which is weird. You got one of Joseph's brothers, Judah, interesting enough, who goes out looking for a call girl one night. His daughter-in-law dresses up as a hooker, has sex with him. They have a baby and it is wild and weird. And you're like, what's that got to do with Ruth? It has a lot to do with Ruth. And we'll check that out next week because we're going to get into kind of like, we're going to wrap up the chapter, It'll be real quick. We just got a, a little bit left, but then we're going to look at some, how the Holy Spirit, if you really believe that this book is written outside of time and space, that is engineered by the Holy Spirit, how can you prove that? We're going to look at some things that show that this book could not have been written by human beings. 
and we'll get into that next week. So I want you to read Genesis 38 and also ask yourself this question. How could Samuel, who was a prophet, he was a judge, he was the last of the judges, and he, he appointed the first king, he knew scripture. He knew that the king was going to come from the tribe of, of, uh, of Judah. How could Samuel anoint Saul, who was from the tribe of Benjamin, as king when he knew that Israel's king was to come from the tribe of Judah? Ask yourself that question. Read Genesis 38. Look at Genesis 49.10. Until next time, Romans 8.28.